Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's it's uh, my real pleasure to welcome you to this talk this evening uh, given by Will Smith. Uh, Will's a uh, uh, different Will Smith from the one you might have been expecting. I hope you, none of you are disappointed. You, you shouldn't be. Um, uh, so uh, Will's a, a reader in the Department of Computer Science uh, and head of the uh, newly reformed, stroke rebooted uh, vision graphics and uh, Vision, learning, and graphics. No, vision, graphics, and learning. Thank you. There we go. Vision, gra vision graphics, and learning group. Um, so he's a very established researcher, and I won't steal his Sunday. He's going to talk about his research. Uh, um, you have to fill five minutes now while that reboots. Okay, I'll <laughs> fill for five minutes. I'll see what I can do. Um, <coughs> um, so I'll, I'll, I'll let him obviously tell you himself about his research, and I'm, I'm sure we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, oh, it might be worth sort of saying a couple of other words about Will Wilds whilst we reboot. Um, uh, Will started in the university, I think, in 2007, as a lecturer. As a lecturer, as a lecturer yes. Yeah. Undergrad in 99. And undergrad in 99. So he's been around a while, <laughs> okay. But I remember him starting as a lecturer because it was actually constantly the same time as I started a lecture in the department as well. Uh, um, and I remember thinking at the time, oh, what a, what a, a bright person this, this is. Uh, I'm, and turns out I was right. Uh, he's doing some really, really fantastic work uh, and has, has done ever since I first met him. Uh, way back when. Um, Will's a, a, clean, a keen climber in his spare time. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, but there you go. He very much enjoys that. Um, and uh, I found out also today that he uh, has an Erdos Bacon number of seven, which is quite respectable. For those of you who don't know, a Bacon number is the number of uh, it's your degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon as an actor. So, so Kevin Bacon obviously has a, a Bacon number of zero. Um, uh, and Will has a, 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 and so if you're in a film with Kevin Bacon, you have a Bacon number of one. If you're in a film with somebody who was in a film with Kevin Bacon, you have a, a Bacon number of two. And you have a Bacon number of three, I believe, which is it's very respectable, okay? I, I, I'm not sure that's paralleled in the department. Uh, so, so uh, though I'd be very interested to hear from colleagues who might be able to correct me on that. Uh, and an Erdos number, which of course is a degree of separation from co-authoring papers uh, with the prolific mathematician uh, Paul Erdos, and you have a respectable Erdos number of four, which is also very good. So, <clears throat> Tins also has a Sabbath number, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to go into that, and you can ask him about it later, perhaps. Um, so, uh, without much further ado, or, or maybe I need, need further ado, are we coming? <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, without much further ado, uh, I will hand over to Will to see what you can do to busk until this yeah, actually yeah. boots up again. I'll try. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, in which case, uh, but first of all, just to say uh, thank you very much for all of you who've come. Uh, thank you also to, to friends and relatives of Will who have come to support him as well uh, in this talk. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoy the talk. Uh, and we'll give Will a round of applause to start, just to say thank you very much for willing, being willing to do this. So thank you very much and good luck. <laughs> so this, this would, would be a very interesting talk to try to deliver without any slides. Um, being very visual. <laughs> so th what you're seeing is the University of York logo because the projection system has rebooted. Luckily there's someone from AV who looks nervously like they might be able to fix it. But I'll, I'll, anyway, I can, I can make a start with, without visual aids. Um, or can, can I? <laughs> All right, I guess I'll have to. Right, so I'm going to talk tonight uh, primarily about machine learning. And this has been a very difficult talk to write because we have such a diverse audience. Um, on the one hand, we have my parents who uh, would not claim to be technologically savvy or... <laughs> they're, now, they're now frowning. Um, and then we've, of course, got like, you know, faculty of the computer science department, uh, many of whom taught me as an undergraduate, I think Jeremy, uh, I don't know who else, maybe someone. Um, and like my PhD students who on many topics know more than me. So th this is quite a difficult talk to pitch to everyone. Um, what I wanted to do was make this really accessible and if anything, by the end of the evening, that you all go away having a really good idea what machine learning really is and how it works. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, we're sort of getting an interesting uh, demonstration of machines, or at least their failures here. Um, 
AV person, should we try rebooting this thing? Right, okay. Um, um, it's just a PowerPoint. <laughs> All right. I'll keep going. So, um, I guess a lot of you have seen in the popular press, increasingly in the last five years, a lot of coverage of AI and probably specifically machine learning. So, it's a phrase that um, crops up a lot and is kind of in the public discourse. You might have even heard some more specific phrases like maybe deep learning. I'm going to try and cover tonight specifically what that means. So, it's fair to say machine learning is having a transformative effect across a very wide range of areas of business, science, natural science, um, allowing us to solve problems that were not solvable before. Um, so that's fine, you're seeing this kind of um, <clears throat> press coverage and hype. <clears throat> Something's happening. Yes! I can see my slides there. Come on. Yes! Ooh. Right. Press coverage and hype. Um, <laughs> But what I wanted to do tonight was kind of go quite a lot deep, like a lot more fundamental than the, the hype and headlines that you will have seen. All this stuff is really exciting, and we'll kind of get to this by the end. Um, but we're going to start out much more mundane, and I'm going to kind of step you through how machine learning works. So to summarize the whole talk, I'm going to start with machine learning. I'm going to talk for a little bit about something called supervised machine learning. This is the, by far the most successful um, kind of flavor of machine learning that we've had till now. This relies on humans, sometimes expert humans, um, providing annotations or labels of vast amounts of data that we can then apply machine learning to. I'll just stop to say something there. I just referred to humans. Someone recently pointed out that I sometimes refer to humans sort of in the third person as if I'm not a human. So I am a human, but when I just say humans, it's just like differentiate it from machines. So um, I'm then going to get on to what I think is the most exciting direction in machine learning at the moment, which is called self-supervised machine learning. And this is a way that you can, a machine can learn something about the world without any labels, without any annotation by a human, just by looking at data. Um, this gets you quite far, and it's also a better model for how humans probably learn, because infant babies are not provided with massive amounts of labels to go with the, the data that they're sensing. And in general, the idea of self-supervised machine learning is that you observe data and then you try to learn predictive models so that you can say what you think will happen um, in some sense. Um, and then you can you know, see how those models fit with your observations and update them over time. However, I, I still am not satisfied with this because this is still a black box approach which throws away all of the knowledge that humans have accumulated over the last sort of 10,000 years of how the world works. So I'm going to finish the talk by covering something um, that I've sort of given the name model-based self-supervised machine learning. It's a bit of a long name, but um, the idea is that you, you try to endow your machine learning system with some things that we already know that we have a good model for. Okay, so that's sort of the, the, what I'm going to cover in the talk. Um, in these public lectures, people often sort of like to give a bit of background on themselves, and I wanted to do that because it actually gives quite a good lead-in to what I'm going to talk about. So let's go back to the late 1980s in the Smith household. And I mentioned before, my parents were maybe not the most tech-savvy people, and for some reason, which I asked my dad about the other week, and they bought us a, an Amstrad computer. 
And looking back, I'm not sure why they bought us this. It was really unlike them. They used to actually steal the aerial from the TV so that we couldn't watch TV all the time. Um, but anyway, they, they, they bought us this computer and we started playing games on it. And we eventually discovered it came with this manual and a ring binder. And at the back of the manual, there were these computer programs written in BASIC. And if you were incredibly patient, you could type them into the computer one character at a time. And as long as you didn't make a single mistake, then when you pressed return at the end, something would happen. Um, obviously, that very rarely happened. In fact, I'm not sure we ever successfully entered a program. And I didn't know what any of this meant, but I was kind of fascinated. Um, an old family friend who was here, Bill, who taught me some early programming, he actually helped us try and debug one of these once and found a mistake in the printed program in the manual, um, but it still didn't even work after that. Okay, so we'll now fast forward um, to sort of the early 90s, me as a teenager. Um, yeah, pretty cool. And, but wait, if you think that's cool, wait till you see this. So... This was where I really got into programming. So I discovered Pascal, which is a programming language, which I'm still fond of. Um, and I became obsessed. I was one of those kids that got really obsessed with computers and programming. And I was trying to think about why I got obsessed. And I was also sort of quite impressed by hacker culture. And I, I came across this thing called the Hacker Manifesto at some point. And I quite like this little bit where it's talking about Basically, that a computer does exactly what you tell it to do. So if it doesn't work, it's because you made a mistake. And um, that gives you a feeling of like amazing freedom and power because you tell it what to do and it does exactly what um, you tell it to do. So that's how I spent kind of my whole like educational career and most of my research career up until about 10 years ago basically programming computers to do stuff. So, I mean, this seems pretty obvious, but let's just make it really clear. You take a computer and you write a program. You then give the computer some input. So if it's a game, you, you know, you're pressing keys for, to control the characters, that's your input, and the computer provides some output. Maybe it draws something to the screen. And the programs that we write are created by human ingenuity. So we come up with algorithms to solve particular problems. Jeremy taught me this particular algorithm. Probably my favorite algorithm still. Um, and you combine these algorithms and data in a clever way and you come up with a program that achieves the thing you want to achieve. So the first thing I want to say about machine learning is it is a completely different way to make a computer do something. So it's fundamentally different to writing a program to make the computer do something. So instead what you do, or at least in supervised learning what you do, is you provide inputs and the corresponding desired outputs. And then the computer creates a program. This sounds remarkable and amazing, but we'll, we'll make it, I'll, I'll crush that in a minute. Um, so this program can now take new input that it didn't see when it was being trained and provide some output which should be a good like, extrapolation or generalization to the behavior you want from your system. If you actually look at the program that is produced by a process like this, it's very unlike something a human would write and it's not really interpretable. So it's basically full of numbers, constants, that the computer has determined are a good way of solving this um, mapping from inputs to outputs. Okay, so let's just delve a little bit deeper into how you would actually do this, because this sounds a bit magic. You give it some data and it gives you a program, so let's, let's simplify it. So really what machine learning is doing is learning a function or finding a function, a mathematical function, that maps your input to your output. And the way it does this is that you're providing desired output. So for that particular input, you're telling it the output that you wanted it to produce. And you need to also provide a loss function, so a way of measuring how well your, your machine is doing on that particular input. 
So this desired output we call a label, and this is key in supervised machine learning. We have to provide the labels. Now, the, the nature of the function, um, we can decide that ourselves, but usually it depends on some parameters or weights. And we can now kind of state what the goal of machine learning is in fairly simple terms. So learning just means find the weights, the W, that makes the loss as small as possible. So if you were to add up all of your errors over all of your data set, you want to make that as small as possible and find the weights that will do that. So then the sort of recipe for machine learning is just decide what f is going to be, what form this function should take, Decide what loss function is appropriate for your problem, and then decide what training data you're going to use to train your system. Um, I've missed one little bit out, which is some A-level maths on how do you update your weights to make the loss go down. So this is something we teach in A-level maths, the chain rule. In machine learning, we call it backprop, so we sound more sophisticated, but really it is just A-level maths. So let's make this even more concrete. I'm going to show you a real worked example, and then we'll move on to some more exciting and interesting stuff. So we're trying to um, come up with some function. Let's take a concrete example. I want a machine where I can input my weight in kilograms, and it will output a prediction of my height. So weight and height are kind of correlated. If you're taller, you tend to be heavier. That's the underlying assumption here. So I go and gather some training data. I measure loads of people's weight and height. Um, and I need to decide the form of the function and what my parameters are going to be. Let's just take the simplest possible function, a straight line between these two things, a linear function. So we can take our data, weights and heights. We're going to try and predict the heights from the weights. And we could make a guess. So this is our first attempt at the function, the program, the machine that's going to solve this problem for us. And this particular program would have two parameters, the intercept and the slope. This is the GCSE maths I mentioned earlier to Rob. <clears throat> so we could now ask the loss function, how well are we doing? Well, this, this model does pretty badly. So um, all of those red lines indicate how far away my model is from the data. So then I could start updating my parameters to try and improve the fit of the model. So let's say I change the intercept, that reduces all the errors. Then I change the slope a little bit, that reduces them further. So actually, if you've done any statistics or anything, you know that this is linear regression and also that there's just a way you can solve it exactly. But of course, for the sorts of problems we want to solve, such a simple function would be no use and wouldn't... Um, allow us to solve the sorts of problems we want to solve. So what's been really successful is instead of trying to find a single function that maps directly from input to output, we do something called deep learning, which again sounds like it might mean something really deep, but actually it means something really simple. And the idea is just that we, we're going to map from input to output via a series of very simple functions applied one after another. So instead of going directly from input to output, we go via a series of feature spaces in between, applying one function on top of another. And these functions are almost embarrassingly simple. We'll, we'll get to what they are in a minute. But there's another aspect to deep learning which is also critical. And that is to basically remove the human entirely from the design of this function. So let's just look back very briefly at how classical computer vision was done. So computer vision is the task of taking an image or videos and extracting some useful information from it. So for example, I might want to know what is this. So classify it as a bowl. Um, I might want to know the 3D geometry of this thing so that I can... Um, predict its appearance from a new viewpoint. So I might want to know what material it's made of or something like that. And the sort of early pioneers came up with a model of how they thought this task was solved. So they thought it went through a, a, a series of stages of increasing abstraction away from the image. Um, and they, they sort of grouped these into three phases. So the first is the primal sketch. 
So they thought that maybe a good thing to do is extract things like edges or contours, regions of dark and bright. Then in the second stage, you start to group those together um, and reason about more complicated cues like shading and um, how texture changes. They call this the 2.5D sketch. And then from there, you abstract completely to a sort of mental model um, which is not present in the image. So now you would say, okay, this is a bowl. I can predict what the parts of it look like that I can't even see. So this work started in sort of the 50s and 60s and dominated for about 40 or 50 years afterwards. In deep learning, we get rid of all of the human choices that went into that process. So the argument is like, why did you decide to extract lines or edges? Who's to say that's a good choice of feature? Maybe they're useless. Just learn everything. So in deep learning, we do what's called end-to-end -end learning. We directly input the thing we measure, so in this case, an image. And the F that I showed you before, the function, the machine, is going to learn everything from the very first low-level features that it decides are useful to extract right through to the output, which might be, this is an apple. And the reason this is so powerful is because any decision that you make as a human, if you decide I'm going to extract edges, if instead you'd allowed a machine to optimize that choice, it will at worst do, it, like, it will either do no worse than what you already had or it will improve on it. So it's always better to allow something to be optimized rather than fix it. So something interesting occurs in these systems that you do get this increasing abstraction as you move through the system. So it kind of has to be that way. At the input, you have pixels, so pixels with RGB values in colors. And at the output, you have something as abstract as this is an apple. And you can actually visualize, we'll see in a moment, that it really is extracting more and more abstract features from the data. Okay, so the last bit I wanted to tell you about, so you've really got like a connection to the, the concrete, low-level, um, how this works, is what are these green boxes here? So the answer is they're a neural network. This has been by far the most successful general um, function for solving all the sorts of problems we're interested in. So what is a neural network? Well, it's very loosely mod modeled on the human brain which we know is made of cells called neurons. And the way neurons work is they're connected, their inputs are connected to the outputs of lots of other neurons. They seem to kind of accumulate the inputs and then make a decision about whether or not they're going to fire. And this is basically a mathematical model that roughly approximates that. So it takes some inputs from um, some other neurons, it multiplies them by some weights, it adds them all up, adds a bias, puts it through some function that doesn't really matter, and it outputs some other number. A neural network is just connecting lots of neurons together. So each of these dots that I showed you here is this simple model of a neuron. And this particular neural network has four inputs and one output. And the idea is that as you move from input to output, the state of these neurons is representing increasingly abstract information about your data. So we have input, output, and some layers in between where something's happening. I'm not going to say any more about the architecture of these things. It's got very complicated. But basically, underlying all modern deep learning is this in different configurations. This particular network is called a multi-layer perceptron. So let's look at what these things actually learn, because I think this is where it starts to get really interesting. So we're now jumping way ahead to a much bigger, more complicated model that's solving the task of face recognition. So what does it learn? Well, we can look at the early layers in the network and visualize what features in an image would excite that neuron, would make it have a large value. And what we see are these sort of, well, they look like kind of edges, right? Bright and dark regions of different orientations. This is pretty interesting because we know from looking at the brain that there are cells in the human visual system that also respond strongly to oriented edges. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, so at the lowest level, it's 
turns out it sort of is looking for edges like we were doing before. Right, now for the task of face recognition, if we go a bit deeper in the network, we can find neurons that get excited by parts of faces, so eyes and eyebrows, um, like hairlines, noses, stuff like that. And then really deep in the network, just before it's about to make the decision of who this person is, we can find neurons that get excited by different face appearances or different positions of faces within the image. Now, if we do the same thing, but for different networks trained for different tasks, something interesting happens. So these are trained for car recognition, elephant recognition, and chair recognition. Um, so you get the same thing at the sort of intermediate level. You can see like car wheels. You can sort of see elephant trunks and parts of chairs. And at the top level, you see cars, elephants, and chairs. But at the bottom level, you can see that actually very similar features are being found. So it seems there are some kind of universal low-level features that are useful um, in visual tasks. Right, so let's now go back to this um, question of like supervision and actually solving interesting problems with the machinery we've just seen. So we could do something like take a deep neural network and train it to classify the contents of an image. So I give it this image of a cat and it learns cat. Basically, if you have lots of data, which means maybe 100,000 images, with the corresponding label, then this works. So if we have really good architectures, all the infrastructure you need to train them, and this will work. We can also solve problems like trying to predict a number, regress a, a quantity. So you might put my image in, and it's going to predict my age is 21.6, which is almost exactly right. Um, Okay, so that's kind of where we have a single label applied to the whole image. What about if we wanted to solve a more interesting task? So now what I want to do is input an image and output the semantic meaning of every pixel. So for example, I want to be able to say that this is a car. This is the road plane. Well, we can do this as well. So long as you've got loads of PhD students willing to sit doing this for hours. Or actually what happens now is it's outsourced, so there's a whole industry around doing this, annotating images. Um, so if you, if you Google online, you'll find these adverts like, you have lots of images, we have lots of data labelers, and you pay them per image to label your data. But it works. It's pretty remarkable. If you, if you get enough data, so this is on the bottom right, this is the output of a neural network, this is the input video. So clearly, if you were trying to build a self-driving car or an autonomous robot moving through an environment, this is a really useful representation. You can start to reason about what these different types of object and parts of the scene are likely to do. Um, so knowing that there's a pedestrian in front of you if you're controlling a car is pretty important. Even better, you can flip the labels around. So you spent all that time labeling the images. What about going from the semantic labels to a photograph, and you can do that. So anyone who's ever spent time like as a Photoshop editor, you're about to be out of work, because um, this exists now. So you can just draw the semantic contents of a scene and get a photorealistic image out the other side that's consistent with the semantic content. There's another ingredient here which I wanted to mention because it, it's pretty cool. Um, so you do need the data I showed you before, all the labels, but you also need an adversary in, for this to work. So what you have to plug on the end is you have to give, when you're training this system, you have to give these Im images to a discriminator that's going to try to predict whether the images are real or fake. Your system then basically plays a game with the discriminator where the the machine is trying to generate realistic images to fool the discriminator, and the discriminator is trying to spot the difference between real and fake images. Now, it's amazing how far you can push this simple idea of supervised learning. So this car, which is being driven autonomously, is being driven simply by a neural network that takes video as input and outputs the steering command. So where should the steering wheel be, and should I be braking or accelerating? 
using pretty simple, like off the shelf networks that anyone could download and train themselves. Um, where does the supervision come from here? Well, it comes from getting humans to drive for thousands and thousands of hours, and you can record the video and what they did with the steering controls. So this kind of works. I wouldn't get in that car if I was you um, for many reasons, but first of all, it doesn't know where it's going, right? All it's doing is looking at the video and deciding how it should steer. So it should do a reasonable job of not crashing um, as long as it doesn't see something it's never seen before. And actually, uh, we're now reaching the end of like where we can get with supervised learning. The self-driving car industry has gone crazy, I would say, in how far that you can push this. So they tried this, and then they realized there were edge cases where it didn't work. There were, there were things it was seeing that weren't in the training data. So there's a famous example of how much effort, I think it was Tesla, put into stop signs in America. So these are all edge case stop signs. So these are like conditional stop signs. So stop. Actually, I can't read that. Except right turns. So if you're turning right, you don't have to stop. So you now need like 10,000 examples of stop except on a right turn. And then there's cases where they've been graffitied or covered in foliage or whatever. Um, or there's a person holding a stop sign, but it's upside down, so you don't have to stop. So how far do you go with this? Like, how long are you willing to pay PhD students to keep labeling images before you think this might not be the right way to solve the problem? So, it's got us a long way, but labeling data, providing the supervision, is very laborious, expensive, and we can't label everything. There are things that we simply can't label, and I'm gonna show you my sort of, sort of toy favorite problem in a minute. But it's also a really bad model for how humans learn. So an infant it is acquiring vast amounts of visual data very rapidly as they're learning to see and then move. But they get almost no information about what that means. So occasionally they get a reward signal, like they get some food or they manage to grasp something. But this is very, very rare compared to the amount of data they're receiving. Most of the time, they're just ingesting data, observing the world, with no idea of what it means, but somehow they learn to make sense of it. So how is that possible? Well, before we get to that, let me just tell you about my sort of favorite toy problem that I've worked on basically since I started my PhD, um, which is called inverse rendering. So this is York Minster. You might come as a tourist and you take a picture, but then you realize you were there on the very rare rainy days we have in York. And you think, oh, I wish that photograph looked lit differently, like there was a bright sun and different sky. Or maybe you think, oh, I haven't composed that very well. I wish I was standing two meters to the left so it was symmetric or something. Um, so inverse rendering potentially gives us a way to, to do this after the fact. So the goal of inverse rendering is to explain why does this image appear as it does? Can we explain it physically? And the answer to why it looks the way it does is because of the geometry of the stuff that's in the scene, the materials that the building is made of, and the lighting that illuminated the scene. The problem is this, this task is completely ambiguous. So like, let's just consider one pixel. Okay, we have a yellow pixel in our um, image. So this yellow pixel could have arisen for many reasons. We might be looking at a yellow object, that's kind of the case. We're looking at sandstone or something. But we might also be looking at a white object lit by a yellow light. Or we might be looking at a white object lit by a white light, but the camera's white balance was wrong, so it made it look yellow. And there's loads of other possible explanations. So let me just kind of um, show you what we try to do in this task. So we take an image's input, and what we would like to be able to do is decompose it into the geometry, this image here is a depth image, so the color is telling you how far away the scene is. So that's kind of the shape of the objects in the scene. The materials, so this is representing the sort of intrinsic color of each part of the scene. 
If I knew that and I were to add light, then I could model how light would reflect and bounce around the scene. And if I put all of that back together, I would get the original image again. The problem is, where can I go to acquire the million images I need, along with this information about the geometry and material properties and so on? The answer is we can't acquire such data. We don't even have a good way of doing it, even if it was laborious. We just don't have a good way of doing it. Um, and I could give you loads of other examples from other domains. So think about like medical imaging, where there might be very few examples of like a particular condition, or maybe you require a world expert to be able to annotate the image. So the question is, what can we do if we have no supervision for solving a task like this? And maybe just a brief word on why you would want to solve this apart from making your photo look cool of York Minster. I like this example. So imagine a robot walking along this pavement and seeing this. Should it think, oh my God, there's a huge crack feature and hole in the road and I'm going to fall into it? Or should it just ignore the incredible visual complexity in the shadow and say, actually, that doesn't mean anything about geometry. It's just a shadow. So that's actually a really difficult task, but pretty key to um, like autonomous vehicles moving around in the world. So we get to self-supervised learning. So I mentioned babies learn by just observing the world. And it seems that while they do this, they start to form models and these models seem to be predictive, so they can start to reason about what they think is going to happen, and then as they acquire more data, they can assess if those models turned out to be true and update them if not. So as they start to do this, they, they learn things like object permanence. So um, the peekaboo game is amazing in the early days when a child is just completely astonished that the face reappears from behind something. And then, of course, like a month later, it, it's not interesting anymore because they, they've learned about um, objects staying where they were. They quickly learn about gravity, for example, that objects fall when they're not supported. You might call what is being learned at this stage common sense, but to me it's pretty amazing that like, a baby can see probably only like tens of pictures of cows in the books they're shown. And then later in life, they can see a completely out of context, real cow in a weird situation standing in the sea and say, it's a cow. This is really difficult for machine learning to generalize from such a small number of examples. Another good one is driving a car. So a typical human will have about 20 hours of lessons to learn to drive a car. Machine learning systems are being given millions of hours of driving and still make foolish mistakes while driving. So how can self-supervised learning work for machines? Well, basically, this is the idea. I'm going to show you a few versions of this idea because I think they're all quite cool. If I just take videos and I give the machine a segment of video and then ask it to predict the next part of the video, I don't need any labels. I just need video, right? So this is pretty cool. You might say, but what's the point of doing that? So we'll come back to that in a minute. But let's first see some different sort of paradigms that fit within this idea. So this was quite a famous early idea, which I think is really neat. So they train a machine that takes as input two patches from an image. And these patches are always taken from an image. One of them is the center patch. And the other one is one of eight possible neighboring patches, like slightly randomly perturbed. And the machine has to guess where it came from. So in this case, it sees um, like the central patch and then the ear up here, so the correct output is three. So to do this, you don't need labels, you just need images. So I can go online and get a billion images really easily from Google or something, and I can train this system to do this task. So let's take another example. I'm shown um, the cat and the ear. What do I need? What's my common sense to be able to answer this question, actually, you need to know quite a lot. You probably need to recognize it's a cat. You probably need to recognize that it's the ear of a cat and that it's the left ear of a cat and that cat left ears are up and left of the cat face. 
So you have to actually learn a lot about the world to solve this task. So, um, okay, is this any use? So I've now got a machine that can tell me where patches are relative to each other. I'll quickly show you why it's kind of useful. So I've got my machine, my F, that does this task, where, you know, where is patch two relative to patch one? But remember what I told you earlier, the early bits of a neural network are very transferable. They learn universal features, and now we're hoping it might even learn good like mid-level features, parts of objects. So we can take the early bit, the red bit, copy it to some other network, and then with much less data, train it to solve some other, pro other problems. So maybe now we've got labels for cat, dog, and person, and I only need to train this smaller green bit. So this is called transfer learning. Um, and obviously, there's loads of different things you might want to do downstream as your task that you're going to fine tune for. And there's different tasks you might do as your proxy task in the first place. Here's another example. Is this video playing forwards or backwards? It's pretty obviously forwards, right? If I play you it backwards, this is weird. This doesn't correspond to like earth physics, right? So Another version of self-supervised learning is I give a video to the machine and the machine has to predict is it playing forwards or backwards. The cool thing about that is it has to sort, learn to solve so many tasks to do that. It has to track the ball to know that the ball is something that's like an object that's moving. And it presumably has to learn to model of physics. Another version is you, you give it part of a video and then ask it what happens next. So to do that, it would have to understand that this is a flaw, that the ball is going to bounce here and that it's going to bounce off at a certain angle and so on. Another example, restoring color to photographs. Um, so I take my color image, turn it into grayscale, give the, color, the grayscale image to my network and then ask it to predict the original color image. So again, I don't need labels, get this for free. But to solve the task, it needs to know a lot about the world. It needs to know that chickens are red on the top and then they're dangly bits. It needs to know that like this is probably foliage and foliage is generally green. There's loads it needs to learn about the world to solve this task. Maybe the most spectacular example of this self-supervised learning is in language, where some people think we've almost solved computational modeling of language. Um, so basically, the task they tend to use in language, they use two tasks. One is masking. So you give, you give the system a sentence, how are something doing today? And it has to predict the missing word. Um, the details of this and how it's trained are immensely complicated, but the, this is, I think, the clever part of it. Um, so basically, the system will make predictions on what how probable each word is to go in this missing place, and in this case, you would have the highest probability. And it gets rewarded when it picks the right word or appropriate words. The other task they use is sentence prediction. So you give it two parts of a sentence, and it has to say, do they actually follow on from each other? Were they really um, one after another in the text? So that would be a positive example. That would be a negative example. So it turns out from just that, you just take text, you don't care what it is, download the whole of Wikipedia, that's what they tend to do, and feed your machine sentences with some words masked or paired sentences that are either following on or not. It basically learns language. It learns grammar, it learns semantics, it learns good sort of pragmatics of how it constructs text. So I thought it'd be fun to put in the title of my talk and then have this machine predict the abstract of my talk. So this is just, honestly, no tricks. I just gave it the title, and it, this is what it predicted. It's grammatically, OK, I don't like the comma before and, actually. But um, if you start to read it, you'll see it, it's very plausible. Like, looks grammatically acceptable, semantically OK. It even does stuff like the first time it uses reinforcement learning, it gives you the abbreviation and then uses that later. 
So this is pretty amazing. So we're now, um, we're training systems with no labels, and in this case, to do something pretty useful. But I'm still a little bit unhappy with this. We don't know how it works. So we, we've got this enormous machine. It's really just a function. It's got loads of parameters, typically tens of millions, hundreds of millions, or even billions. And they've been tuned, and now it can do something amazing, but we don't know how. Should we care about this? Well, I think we should for many reasons. One is that um, in terms of kind of safety, not knowing how something works can be um, problematic, and it doesn't allow us to make any kind of assurances about what it's going to do. Um, but I wanted to kind of like uh, take this to its logical conclusion. So it may surprise some of my PhD students to know that I've actually produced a neural network that has human level language understanding, speech, face recognition, reasoning, motion planning, navigation, honestly. So, <laughs> but I don't know how it works, and I can't really say much credit for how it works, um, or why it works. And I kind of feel like doing deep learning is a little bit like this. We know this magic recipe, download a ResNet, get loads of data, clever self-supervised, it does something. But we haven't really learned much about how these things actually work. So I want to finish up by talking about um, just a little bit of my work where we try to put some interpretability and human intelligence back into this idea of self-supervised learning. So let's like just briefly take stock of everything humans have learned in the last 10,000 years. We'll pick out two examples. So I'm a big fan of um, making use of like very old ideas. So this is Johann Lambert, and in 1760, he worked out that basically the brightness of something varies with the cosine of the angle between the light source and the surface normal. The thing that really impresses me about this is he did it with candles and that's it basically, some candles and a white wall and he, he determined this. His trick was that you, it's quite easy to say if two things have equal brightness. So he was able to use that to, to come up with this rule. That law is in every graphics renderer on the planet. So Lambert's law is still in every renderer. Like all, whenever you watch a movie, you see all those cool things on the screen, they've got Lambert's law in them. Here's another good one. Um, in somewhere around the 10th, 11th century, Al Hazan um, wrote down the pinhole camera model. So how 3D geometry project projects to a 2D image. So we know this stuff, right? We know those two things. We know those two models. Can we put them back into machine learning so it's not so black box? So we know these models and we use them. So taking the example before, if we, have, if we know the geometry of a scene, if we know the material properties, if we know the lighting, we've got this whole field of computer graphics that uses Lambert's law and the pinhole camera model and all this other stuff and produces really realistic image, images. Now we will exploit this to train our machine learning system. So this is what I call model-based self-supervision. So the idea is we go from some interpretable parameters, so they might be geometry, lighting, that kind of thing. We put them through this forward simulation that exploits all of human knowledge up to this point, all these clever people that came up with these things that are true. And that can make predictions about what the world might look like. Now, the way we use that is we use it to train our black box, which is going to try and solve the inverse problem. So I'm going to try and take my input image. This black box is going to learn to get me back my interpretable parameters. And the way I'm going to know if it's working is because I'm going to put it back through the bit that we do know, the fixed bit, the forward model, get a prediction, and then I can compare the two. And I can train from that. So this is... Um, this is what we did in, in a very successful piece of work. Don't worry about the detail of this. I just wanted to kind of show that what this system does 
It takes an image's input and it outputs material properties, so like the intrinsic color of the object, some representation of the geometry and the lighting. And the way it does it is by predicting an image and comparing it back to the beginning. So I don't need any labels. You may remember earlier I said this is completely ambiguous, and it is. So if you look at this image, you might be looking at a violin in 3D hanging on the door, or you might be looking at a painting of a violin hanging on the door, and both are, both are valid. Um, so how can we distinguish between these two cases? Well, it turns out that humans exploit a lot of prior information when they do this. So I really like this il illustration. So everyone in the room will be perceiving this as convex and this is concave, I assume. And if I reverse them, it, it will flip. And the fact that you're making that interpretation comes from the fact that you have a prior model that lighting tends to come from above. Okay, and this makes sense because humans evolved in a world where light tends to come from the sky. So we can exploit this now in this like, different paradigm. We can learn stuff about natural lighting. We can look at loads of real environments, learn the statistics of it, and then put that intelligence into our model, impose that prior on our parameters. That's exactly what we do. I'm going to jump to showing you what this thing can do. So basically, we can give it one, one photo, and we can decompose it into this physical explanation. So what are the materials in the image? In this case, we predict shadows as well. What's the geometry? What's the lighting? Let's now run this on a video. It's a bit more interesting to see it. So we're just running it on every frame of the video. Uh, this is just a tourist video in front of York Minster. And probably a good one to look at is this frame. So this is like a rendering of what it thinks the geometry in the scene looks like if you take off all the materials and the effects of the lighting. And this one is also quite interesting. So this is if you get rid of all the shading, you're just left with what the material properties are. You may say, why on earth would you want to do that? Um, well, one reason is that it allows you to relight images. So this was my dream earlier. So I can now take a photo and after the fact, edit the direction that the lighting is coming from. And in this version, we also got it to hallucinate a sky that's consistent with the, the foreground. And just to sort of close off my connection back to human vision, we thought it'd be interesting to give this system some sort of um, illusion images and see what it did. So for, first, this is, um, this is interesting because humans often differ in their convex concave interpretation. So if I look up at the screen, it flips for me, but I see this one as convex. And this one is concave, but it, you may be getting different, as you move around the images, you might be getting different interpretations. Because our system has this, we gave it this assumption that lighting must come from above, kind of. Um, it's predicted lighting from above in both cases, and that means it's had to make all of these um, convex and all of these concave. We thought this would be fun. This is... We have no problem interpreting this image, but our network completely fails to do that. So it basically, what we're looking at here on the right is a sort of visualization of the geometry, and it just sees the geometry in the reflection. It doesn't see the geometry of the telephone box or whatever that is. <coughs> Another visual illusion, a trompe l'oeil. So um, this is just the side of a building with clearly there's no sky here. First of all, it fooled our sky detector. So it thought we masked this out with sky. But also it's recovered the geometry of the windows painted on here and the door and so on. Right, last thing. I'll just show you. Um, we've taken this quite a lot further. So we've gone to a scenario where you have lots of images. So I can go on Flickr and I can type Trevi Fountain and I can get like 20,000 images of the Trevi Fountain. And then we can train a model that learns 
the complete geometry of this whole scene in a way that's realizable. So that I can now not just edit the lighting like that, I can also change my viewpoint. So we're kind of, we're getting close to my dream of taking, taking a photo and then being able to um, change the, the visual, visualization afterwards. So I'm gonna close there, maybe a couple of closing thoughts. So we started off with some pretty mundane stuff. Machine learning is just fitting a function to some data, as simple as a straight line. But despite that, it can do pretty amazing things. So I thought I'd just show you like this is what everyone's getting excited about at the moment, like text to image of remarkable quality and this is advancing on a daily rate. So I can type a sentence like teddy bears working on new AI research and get a photo of this content that looks pretty plausible. Um, I also, I was listening earlier to uh, a podcast in which Joe Rogan interviews Steve Jobs. That God wrote a book Steve. called the Bible or Quran or something. And that, that's the end of the story, but my take on it is okay. So what is of course, Steve Jobs is dead, right? So Joe Rogan never interviews Steve Jobs. This is a 19-minute podcast, which is pretty plausible in terms of the content, the, the voices, the discussion. Um, so this is pretty amazing. So it can do amazing things, but to, to some extent or to a large extent, we still don't really know how it's doing them. So I think this is like the direction I'm most interested in pushing. Like, how much can we open the black box and fit models um, to help us understand what's really going on? And also, pragmatically, we just can't label the whole world. So we need these methods to allow us to solve problems where it's just not feasible um, to get the labels that we need. So I'll just finish by saying thank you to all the people who um, I did this work with and the department for giving me a job for the last 15 years or something. And an office and stuff, thanks. Um, and most of this work was done uh, when I had a fellowship from the Lee for Hume Trust and the Royal Academy of Engineering. And last of all, thank you to my wife and daughter for listening to my weird ramblings on things like this. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, we do have some uh, time for questions, and Emily and David will run around with the microphones. Please use, wait for the microphone to reach you so that the people who are listening online will be able to hear your question as well. Um, uh, otherwise, Will, I'll let you manage the questions. I'm sure you know okay. what you're doing. Okay. So, questions. Oh, it might be, all right, okay. I thought, you, yeah. Anyone with their hand up will do. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, so you based uh, everything on the visual analysis, but is it possible to, uh, to combine it with some uh, capture or sensor, such as kind of uh, radar or something like that? For example, when you saw the picture with the blue sky or the other picture with the street and the shadow, uh, you say that, for example, the automatic car will be disturbed to know if it's real, really the street or if it's uh, if there is some uh, some hole in it and so on. But if you have if you mix it with a capture with sen and sensor, uh, with send wave and back, you you will know that it's uh, the the road is plain. Is it possible? Yes, to have this combination. Yeah. So I think it's a great question. So first of all, if if you're building a self-driving car, I think you should just put lidar on it because it makes everything easier. But that doesn't mean the problem uh, isn't interesting because there will always be scenarios where, for whatever reason, you only have one sensor or you want to simply process all the visual data that already exists that was captured without those other sensors. Um, but I think we're at a really exciting moment for combining different modalities of data so the architecture behind that amazing language model and the uh, language to, to image model, one of the amazing things about it is it can ingest any mode of data. So we're just at the point where like, we have the tools that it's quite easy to take like audio data, visual data, 3D, whatever, and reason about it in a sort of unified way. 
So I think, yeah, practically, that's like a good point and it's a good way to go. But also, from the machine learning point of view, we're now ready to deal with that sort of mix. Um, is your aim to replace human beings? Your daughter's doing okay, but, um, you know, what, what is the, the purpose? If a, an average toddler can actually out, outthink your IBM Blue or whatever, you know, why are you spending so much money when you could be doing something useful? <laughs> right. Good question. Um, I rarely ask myself what the point of it is. I always just do the next thing that seems interesting. Um, but I know that's not going to satisfy your question. Why do this? I mean, many reasons. A lot of this, okay, why do you want a picture of teddy bears under the water? You don't. But what I've talked about has incredible practical value in loads of different areas. Um, is it to replace humans? Maybe. And if it was replacing them doing incredibly mundane, unsatisfying jobs, then that's a really good thing, I think. So if it's sort of practical, repetitive, it doesn't have to be practical. Most people sit in an office in front of a computer doing mundane stuff, like writing the same email reply over and over again or clicking on stuff. Um, this is a waste of human... That's lovely, yeah. but I've done loads of jobs which are mundane, but they pay the mortgage, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> what are all these so unemployed... I'm not, an, I'm not an economist, but I, like... I hope there might be some model where basically robots and computers do a lot of the work that needs doing, and I haven't thought this through as a, yeah, and maybe like all the companies that own them have to pay loads of tax, then we all just get a universal basic income and just sort of read books and go on holiday. example, we place pilots where a computer may be able to predict um, an incident occurring, whereas a human being could not, possibly, for example. Yeah, so, um, I mean, pilots, uh, a lot of what a pilot does is done by a machine anyway. John over there will be able to tell us more. I mean, my understanding is on the very big passenger jets now, it's very rare that a pilot actually lands them. Is that true? So um, definitely, so that, that would be an example of where the skill or the reliability is so important that you would rather a computer do it if it can do it. Yeah. That's good in one sense, but equally um, it could be perhaps one day that a computer takes the emotion out, that takes the emotion out of it might have a more you know, successful outcome than a human that does use emotion. Some so I think this is part of the dream of self-driving cars. In most car accidents, in principle, a computer could avoid what happens because they don't have any reaction time. A human requires, like, on the order of seconds to do something. Um, a machine can do, you know, hundreds of billions of calculations in the time that a human is just thinking about breaking. The problem is the task is so difficult. So I think we will get there. Like, we won't have car crashes one day. That's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> um, like, you know, my car already automatically breaks when it senses something in front. Um, I'm certain, don't know when, but we'll get to the point where no one will have car crashes because the cars will just avoid it. Um, yeah. Hi, Will. Uh, thank you so much for the call, talk. Was really um, you explained things really well. Uh, <laughs> um, I had a question from a, from a practical point of view, from an efficiency point of view. Uh, you mentioned that, especially with vision networks, the early layers often just do very similar, if not the exact same thing. How does that translate from network to network? Like when you take uh, the early layers from one network and you apply it to the other, surely with just because you need a lot of label anyway, it would just train to do the same things by itself. Um, is there sort of like a one better network that can identify edges and shapes that 
sort of generally works? Have you, have you found anything like that? Or? So actually, the, the, way it's, it, the way we're really moving is towards what people are calling foundation models, which basically have already learned this common sense kind of reasoning. So we're already at the point where you can show these foundation models an image and sort of interrogate it and ask it about the image, and it shows really quite deep understanding. So in other words, those foundation models probably already nearly know how to solve most visual tasks. And it's a case of then just designing a small amount of like prompts or maybe additional data to fine tune it to solve your specific task. So that's kind of the way we're going. I don't know if that answers your question. I think, yeah. So my kind of question's around like when you have these kind of learning situations against another situation, like in finance, like say in trading bots that are battling against each other where you're in a situation which is far beyond where it starts. Like you pose the fact that you would have two AIs, one trying to detect whether it was fake, where one was trying to produce something which was better. Um, isn't the risk that they're just gonna completely go off on a tangent which isn't actually accurate to where you wanna be at all? Yeah, so the assumption is that like the world you're trying to learn about isn't changing, but in like finance where you have computers trading against each other, they they change the world. So when one learns a better trading strategy, it changes the behavior of the stock price and then your model's wrong. Um, I don't know, in the physical world, I guess that could happen with self-driving cars where they try and learn to optimize at junctions and nip in front of each other or something and then... So my kind of yeah. question was more or less, there's obviously a lot of conversation around digital art and AI is produced in art. And when my daughter mixes loads of colors together, it comes out as a brown mess. Like, is there like a trajectory where it's, it's just going to be this kind of recycled kind of uh, art, yeah. which kind the of the depth of creativity, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Hi, Will. Um, so, do you think that self supervision can be applied to everything? So, for instance, we know that since we already have models for rendering a 3D world, we can just render a bunch of rooms and then send that to the computer and it will be close enough to reality that the computer will then be able to take photos of the real world and, and get the like materials and stuff out of it. But for, for like the example of the semantic breakdown of, of the image of like a, a car going through a street, is there something like could you apply self-supervision to that without having to label everything or could you apply self-supervision realistically to any scenario? So I think yes. You can, but it, you're right, it's more difficult depending on the task. There are already self-supervised semantic segmentations. Obviously, you don't know, without learning from something, you don't know what it is. So you might be able to segment a car, but not be able to say, that's a car, it's a vehicle, it drives. So that would require knowledge from somewhere else, which these foundation models learn from text and images loosely paired. So that's where the knowledge comes from. But yeah, I kind of do believe it's applicable to any problem. So um, thank you very much for your questions. We're just aware of time, so I think we'll draw things to a close. Um, uh, uh, thank you all very much for your, your kind attention to Will's lecture. Well, Will, thank you very much for a, a superb lecture, really ent uh, both entertaining and, and edifying. Uh, I, and I've learned something, <laughs> which uh, just goes to show the neural networks really do work. So um, thank, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking Will again. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if you have taken a broader glass in here, you weren't meant to, but I, that's, <laughs> nobody's watching. Um, uh, could you please make sure it gets to returned to the tables outside, please? Thank you very much. <laughs>